We're going to start off with the most obvious one to get my attention. The modern CLI renaissance. You know for a fact that I love the CLI. And if there is a renaissance coming, you know how happy I'm going to be? Do you have any idea what kind of person I'm going to be deep inside my soul? Because this is what I want for every last person. You know, one of my biggest mistakes I ever made as a, little, as a wee little child was the fact that I never pushed hard into learning the CLI while going to university while taking the time uh, through my first couple years of professional life. And so it's a wrong I've been trying to write. It all really, truly started, obviously, when I started learning Vim Motions for IntelliJ, but it never really set in until I watched a coworker, Anders Backen, work on his machine. I came up to him one day and I said, hey, I have this bug, I think, in this version of Netflix. Could you, could you like, walk me through what's happening here? And I, never, I didn't really know C++ or anything at that point. This was 2015, maybe. He was like, hold on, I'm working on something. And it was just like, it was like flashing. I was like getting strobe effect. I was seizuring like on one side and he was just flying. And I could not believe what he was doing because I was fast. You should have saw me on the options and the arrow keys and the shift and the highlighting. Bro, I was fast. And then I learned Vim Motions and I was fast at Vim Motions. But I have never seen anything like this. And that is the day I decided I was going to use Linux because I was like, you know what? I don't know what he just did or how he just did it, but I want whatever he has. Granted, he was using Emacs, you know, RIP Emacs, but I, I kept with Vim and Vim was great. I actually did. I did. I, let's just say I got a little bit curious. You know, hey, I was just freshly out of college, still a little bit curious, had my college curiosity. I spent a year in Emacs. Okay. <laughs> Doom Emacs to be specific, and then I switched. That's why to this day, if you ever see me using this, if I go, uh, if I'm in a file, I go leader PV. Anybody, huh? Leader PV, leader PF for all files. Ah, huh? ah, huh? right. I think everybody recognizes that. Yeah, yeah. Nobody's perfect. Lisp is not for everybody. Lisp is not for me. I use daily Emacs vanilla at home. They at work. Yeah, I use I use uh, NeoVim. Oh no, uh, you're Emacs tainted. I did. I got Emacs tainted. Has Emacs tutorials on his YouTube channel. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah. Uh, Emacs, I, I think Emacs is a pretty great, it's a pretty great editor. And Bash Bunny really, really loves it. I could probably end up loving Emacs as well. I just wanted to tell you that story to kind of give you the motivation for why I, why I jumped into the command line as well. I jumped into the command line because I saw somebody who was really, really efficient. And I think for a lot of people, they don't see how the command line could be efficient. Therefore, they don't ever lean into it. It's just some arcane thing that people used to use to use a computer, and we're slowly getting away from it. So therefore, you use your editor with a little bit of a terminal to be able to, say, start a server or to run some things. But really, you just run all your tests in your uh, editor. You do all your stuff in your editor. You wouldn't actually use your terminal. And I think a lot of people have adopted this mentality, and I certainly have adopted this, uh, this mentality because I never really understood why I should lean into the command line. If that makes sense. Yeah, CLI is peak efficiency. It's it's very, very true once you get it. And that's why even to this to this to this day, I have Vim always on my first tab in whatever project I'm in. And like my my little main uh oh, look at that. That was my I closed this server yesterday. You guys doxed me so uh, you guys spammed me so hard. Uh always, whenever I do any sort of basic operations over and over again, it's always on number two. So no matter what project I go to, if I go to Vim Arcade. I'm already, I already know that if I'm in one, it will always be Vim. If I'm in two, it's always me doing some temporary task. It's just like a great way to align my brain. I don't know. I really like it. All right. Over the past few years, it seems like the rate at which new CLI tools are being written has picked up back up again, accelerating after seeing relatively little activity between 1995 and 2015. Is that true? Because Java, Java was birthed 1994, if I'm not mistaken. I, I wonder why this is uh, true. I have no idea. I'd like to talk about this trend I've noticed where people are rewriting and rethinking staples of the command line interface, why I think this trend might be happening, and why I think this trend is a good thing. Okay? I'm excited. I'm very excited. Uh, history. The terminal and the command line interface have been staples of computer user interfaces before computer monitors were even available, with some of the first computers offering an interactive mode in the late 1950s. The recognizable Linux terminal traces its lineage to the very first version of Unix in 1971. Yeah, Ken Thompson, um, Richie, who else was in that cohort? 
This is right after what 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 is the everyone always corrects me. What is the name of the the OS that Unix is based off? It starts with an M. It's not Maven. It Maples, Minix, 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 Maltics, Maltics is the term. Maltics. I believe it's Maltics. Yeah, it's Maltics, not Minix. Maltics. Right? Maltics. Uh, I think uh, 1995 to 2015 was just a U- UI heavy time where less tech savvy end users were doing some tech stuff or just general computing. I know people who can only use Git with a UI tool and not the CLI at all. Yeah, maybe that was the time. Maybe during 1995, computers were getting good enough that editors like uh, Visual Studio or any of whatever was the thing that people used started to be started becoming a thing. And so you didn't need to have all the switching. Instead, you could have a single platform, and this made it really easy for new people to be able to get started. Therefore, I could, it could be a good argument. Uh, many utilities that Linux users interact with every day, commands like uh, RM, CAT, CD, CP, MAN, and a host of other core commands trace their initial versions to the first version of Unix. Other tools are a bit newer, such as SED. It's 1974, just blazingly new. Uh, by the way, that's SED was invented the same year TCP. DIFF, same year as TCP. BC, one year after TCP, make, that's Vi, and then Vi, 19, uh, 1976. That's kind of crazy, Vi, 1976. I thought Stack Overflow just reliably informed us that Vi was created in 2012. Bruh. It's also, by the way, Vi is also hard to call a command line tool. I mean, I know it's on the command line, but it's it it's fundamentally different than sed, diff, bc, and make. There were a few more tools introduced in 1990s, such as vim 91 and ssh 95. Those are hard to call tools as much as they're like they're like apps. They're a TUI, right? They're a UI but built into the terminal. It's it's hard to call it a CLI stuff. I mean, I know I understand it is a command line interface, and the nuance here is like arguing the difference between software engineer and software developer. It, this is like this is the classic developer behavior well actually you know i hear you're saying it's a ui uh, cli tool but actually um even one installed yesterday are older than linux itself okay so now there's nothing wrong with this the tools work fine but in the half century since they were first written terminals and the broader linux ecosystem have all changed terminals now have capacity to display more colors Unicode symbols and even inline images. Yeah, that stuff is kind of crazy. What I, someone did a presentation at, at uh, one of the Vim Confs about being able to do images. It's pretty crazy that that exists. Terminal programs now coexist with graphical user interfaces, and only a small subset of computer users even know they exist. Whereas in the past, terminals were the only way to interact with computers. Facts on facts, right? Uh, these changes to the environment surrounding CLI apps in recent years have led to a resurgence in development of command line utilities. Instead of just developing completely new tools or cloning old tools, I've noticed that people are rethinking and reinventing tools that have existed since the early days of Unix. This is actually a pretty interesting... I, for better or for worse, these are, this is very interesting. I do think RipGrep is a very interesting uh, kind of case study in the sense that RipGrep is not a replacement for grep. Bat is not a replacement for cat. Those are very different experiences. When you bat, it's fundamentally slower. When you rip grep, it uses a lot more system resources. So if you had 16 cores and you had to search through 16 different uh, sources of data that could spawn a bunch of stuff, it would be hard to use a lot of rip grep potentially. I'd have to do more research into this. Where is it going to be spawning a bunch of threads and then you're going to have like thread overload? How's it going to happen? I don't know. I'd have to actually like look into this and figure it out. Whereas using parallel and grep and and some log sources, it can be really, really nice. And so, yeah, RG fork bomb. I just don't know because I haven't used RG enough to, to have a really great idea about that. But I know RG is really, really great. I use it in my editor all the time. I love it. Um, this isn't just some compulsive need to rewrite every tool out there in your favorite language. Well... <laughs> I mean, I mean, come on. Is that true when it comes to Rust? Come on, are we being real here? Can we, uh, Come on. You're telling me that not all of them are compulsive uh, rewrites? Yeah, debatable, debatable right there. Uh, people are looking at the problem these tools set out to solve and are coming up with their own solutions to them, exploring the space of possible solutions and taking new approaches. It's this exploration and solution space that I'd like to look at the ways that tools are changing, why people are changing them, and what kicked off this phenomena. All right. Listen, I, I mean, I am curious. I, 
I love the fact that CLIs are on the res- like they they are resurging. I have definitely most certainly seen more than I've ever seen in the last couple years than anything else. Same with FD. Yeah, FD is definitely another version of this, right? Um, the lesson learned from the past, a large amount of innovation in the area, I think can be attributed to lessons that have been learned in 50 years of using software. Sharp edges we have repeatedly cut ourselves on, untutative interfaces that repeatedly trip us up, and a growing frustration at the limitations that maintaining decades of backwards compatibility imposes on your tools. These lessons, by the way, is that Windows mentioned? Uh, these lessons have been gathering in the collective consciousness through cheat sheet guides and frequently asked questions, resources to guides, to guide us through esoteric error messages, complex configurations, and a dozen upon dozen of flags. Okay, I have no idea what we're talking about. Are you saying things? I mean, is this? Are you subtly jabbing at FFmpeg? When is FFmpeg being rewritten? Like, I don't even know. Okay, I've I've been able to track up until here. I'd like to go over. Uh, let's see, over a couple more of the prominent lessons that I feel terminal tools have learned in the past several decades. Okay, let's do this. I'm in. I'm in. Good out-of-box config uh, experience. While configurability is great, one should not need to learn a new configuration language or dozens of hundreds of options to get a usable piece of software. I do agree with this. Good defaults are fantastic. Remember the uh, Google accidentally deleted that one, the, the Australian investment cloud? Does anybody remember that? Well, Google accidentally deleted, I forget the name of it. It was called like Una something. Una something. I, I cannot seem to remember the, the second part of the name, but I do know it was Una. It was like Unimax or something like that. And this Una investment firm in Australia that invests pensions, U- Unifund. Yeah. Unisuper. Is it Unisuper? Unisuper? Yeah, something like that. Anyways, it doesn't really matter what it is. They moved off of their own kind of like private hosting into the Google Cloud due to some ease of software. I forget the specific software. And the person that set it up, their internal tool had a bad default, which was designed from testing, which is very funny to have your defaults based on testing. So since there was no expiration date provided, it defaulted to one year. And when that expiration date went across, it would delete the entire private cloud as if it were a testing instance. And so, you know, whatever, Uniswap, you know, fund, you know, super, whatever that thing was called, just disappeared. And it was quite wild. Yeah, let's see. Here we go. There we go. This one right here. Yeah, you know, super. There you go. Effectively, Google Cloud just destroyed them in just a second. Luckily, they had uh, these uh, two, three, one practice where they actually stored in a separate cloud some of their uh, some of their backups. And so when it was a bit bigger than accidentally deleting a table, yeah, it was deleting like they, they got completely wiped. So when that happened, uh, they were able to go back and restore everything. They stored backups on AWS. Very, very smart of them to do that. But it was it was quite quite wild. My pension actually is just a test to see if the state can afford it. <laughs> is that it? Anyway, so I really do like this. This is a very good thing. My Also, my boss was really into having great defaults and a great command line experience. And he was really good at identifying where things and how things should go. And I always loved kind of his mentality and his philosophy on building good UI to, or uh, TUI tools or CLI tools. Configuration should be for customization, not setup. One of the early, <laughs> tell that to the JavaScript ecosystem. One of the earliest examples of this principle may be the fish shell. Both Zish and Fish have powerful prompt and auto-completion engines, but Zish requires you to set up a custom prompt and enable completions in order to use the features that set it apart from uh, from the completion or competition. With no config file, Zish is no better than Bash. When starting Fish for the first time, however, its powerful auto-completion and information-rich prompt are in front and center with no configuration required. Of course, Fish still has the same level of configurability as Zish. It also just has sensible defaults. Fish is one of those few examples. Oh, by the way, the guy who invented Fish, the ridiculous Fish, worked at Netflix, worked on my team, in fact, and was right next to me. Uh, yeah, oh my zish. I just use oh my zish as the sensible defaults. Uh, but it seems like any time you talk about fish, people come out of the of the woodwork and they they will uh, they will come out with pitchforks and they will murder you. Like actual murdering and unibombering will happen. Like they they hate they fish. Fish is the oddest has the oddest response I've ever seen. It's either extreme love or extreme hatred. It's wild. 
Yeah, I've seen people literally, like, yeah, unironically, it's not like, oh, people got angry. It's like people lose their shit over fish. It's okay. Just let fish exist, okay? Yeah, yeah. This uh, this is where I agree. This is where I agree. I think this is fish's biggest problem. Uh, there we go, right here. Fish really changed the game for me, but the fact you can't rely on the standard syntax of bash shell configuration with its own sublanguage is tough. Yeah, it's the reason primarily I haven't used fish is I don't want a... I don't want I don't want to have to learn yet another syntax to interact with my operating system. I already I already know just enough bash to be horrendously incompetent. I don't need to know boat. I I don't need to know more, right? To demonstrate my point, this is the default prompt for Zish with no configuration. It only shows host name, none of the advanced features you can get out, uh, out of Zish prompt even without plugins. Yep, Arch laptop. By the way, I use Arch by the way. I just want you to I just want you to know this is just the default config. You know, I'm just, hey, it's the default configuration. I'm just letting you know that it's Arch. Arch, just in case you're wondering. Uh, here, here is Bash's prompt. It actually gives more information than Zish, even though Zish can do, uh, can do more when properly configured. There you go. Here is Fish's default prompt. It has a few colors. It shows me everything the Bash prompt does in addition to uh, the Git, Git branch. Yep. That's good. Text editors uh, are another great example of the evolution that, of out of box defaults, Vim and NeoVim both improved on their predecessors, but m much of that improvement is locked behind extremely complex configuration experiences and plugins. Here's four different terminal text editors with no configuration applied. My guess is that this bottom one is going to be Helix, and he's going to talk about how amazing Helix is. Again, I'm not arguing against Helix. I'm just not convinced that a new set of motions that buy no further optimizations are in fact any better. And Helix D's nuts, by the way. Uh, I can tell it's Helix. I know Helix. I can see Helix by sight because it has that purple th uh, the purple theme right off the rip and it has autocomplete off the rip. So, I, I mean, I know what Helix is. I can just see it. But my big gripe is what is, what is the W? An autocompleted editor or a set of new motions that provide no better optimizations? Helix user here? Yeah, I, I mean, Helix seems like a great editor. I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not, dogging on the helix itself it's just that the sales part of having a new set of motions i just don't understand the the w behind it all is vim the most advanced cli regarding ui uh likely at least in the top five neovim is probably definitely in the top five i don't have any issues switching between helix and neovim the helix introduced me to modal editing so i have a soft spot for it okay well that's that's nice that you have uh that you, you tried it out i just i just find that it's sales part of new motions. The Kakwan motions, the Kakwan is just wild to me. Via the top left is our baseline. And as far as I can tell, it doesn't actually support much configuration. Via is not a baseline. <laughs> it just can never, it's just not a baseline. It's just the lowest possible. Okay, I guess you can call that the baseline. It's just, why would you? Nobody, very few people I know use Vi as a default editor. It's pretty much some coding guy and RWX Rob, right? I don't know of anybody else that uses it as the default editor. Uh, Vim top or Vim top right greatly improved Vi, adding the uh, things such as syntax highlighting. By the way, syntax highlighting did not happen until the '80s. Did you know that? Unix was written without syntax highlighting. Rewind it a little bit. Seymour Cray hand put in on a front panel an operating system from memory. Byte by byte. True gigachads. We have it easy. Think about this one. LSPs were not created until what, 2015, 2016, right in that era? It might have been 2014. They weren't widely available and used all over the place until 2017, 2018. So think about that for a second. That the only way to have autocomplete was to own one of those editors or use NetBeans and one of the very popular languages, and it kind of worked. IntelliSense was not, IntelliSense was bespoke though, per language. So you could have, like, the reason why we have so many languages is because I personally believe that LSPs made it possible for a lot of people to use them. Uh, LSP is older than me. All right, um, unfortunately, I do have to permanently ban you uh, because that means you're like 11 or 12 years old. Remember, when you say that, in fact, I believe Twitch has an auto-ban feature. When you say you're less than 13, like, I, I will get permanently banned from Twitch allowing you to hang out. So you said it, 
not me. I'm just letting you know you cannot say those things. Okay? I have to ban you. Like, I, I, I actually have to. It's a self wrecked I know. For example, the earliest things I did when I first made a VimRC was to enable indent folding, make some better keybinds for navigating windows, and add... By the way, navigating windows, that's always a weird one that people make keybinds for. People will trade window navigation. They'll do, like, Control-L to hop over one window when Control-WL hops over one window. It's like, yeah, you're saving that one keystroke for an operation you very rarely do when you could have control L, W, H, J, K. Like, you could have all those for actually having a really nice navigation experience. Uh, and adding a line number uh, ruler to the side. NeoVim, bottom left, improve, further improved on Vim, adding support for tree sitter and the language server protocol, but out of the box experience is the exact same as Vim. Yeah, that's because NeoVim is, in fact, the truest version of Vim. I know that may be hard to hear, and some people hate that, but I'm just saying NeoVim is the community embracing Vim and then creating it for them. Because remember, Vim was created for Bram and by Bram and for Bram. And when Bram wanted something, that's what Bram did. That's why there is, uh, I mean, bless his soul. He is a very, very nice guy and never asked for anything, like truly a really great guy. But nonetheless, instead of embracing just, you know, embed Lua, call it a day. He wanted to make his own language because he wanted to make his own language. And I'm not even arguing against that. But NeoVim just said, we'll just embrace Lua. We'll instead use Lua for, you know, we'll, Im we'll embed Lua over the course of a couple days. Over the next course of the year, we'll make it really, really great. And we're done. We don't even have to have our own custom language. There's no nothing new you need to learn. Lua's already out there. Just go enjoy it. Right? And that's why I love, I love, I love. He, yeah. Bra yeah. Bram's only ask was for donations for uh, children in Africa. <laughs> like, that's it. That was that was Bram's ask in Vim. And, and to this day, if you open up a fresh a fresh instance of Vim, it still says it right there. They still, uh, they still have it right there, which is pretty cool. Chad, absolute Chad. Hey, Corgi. Uh, in order to take advantage of the LSP and tree setter support, you have to install plugins, which means learning uh, a which means learning a NeoVim package manager, learning how to configure LSPs, and configuring a new LSP for every language you want to use it with, or finding out about Mason and being okay with having multiple levels of package management in your NeoVim install alone. Yeah, I mean, NeoVim just exposes this to you. It just exposes what VS Code does. So you determine how it does it. And f for worse or for better, I do agree with this. You know, it would be really nice if you just could, if Mason right here, by the way, this is Mason, was just available. You know, here's all the different language servers that have been uh, registered with Mason. And you can just install any of them, you know. You can just install any of them. If I wanted uh, Solang, I just press I and boom, it does it. So, don't get me wrong. NeoVim is a great editor once you get over the hump. I still use it as my daily driver, but not so much of its, let's see, but so much of its functionality is simply hidden. True, true. That's a good, it's a good, uh, it's a good observation. Oh, why do, you, uh, why do you need a language server? I like language servers just, I mean, honestly, I like my favorite part about a language server is navigation. And what I mean by that is um, that. Go to definition. You know what? How many, how many different ways, to, where do I use it all? Like for me, language servers, best operations are navigation-based. Anything beyond navigation-based, honestly, I could do without. Like the autocomplete, I actually... I use, but it's not necessarily the most useful. For me, this is the most useful, is this right here, is documentation in editor. So when it, let, let's say I'm, I'm, I'm calling sprint F. I like to be able to go in here and just see, oh, okay, I need to provide a format, sprint F formats according to the format specifiers and return. Like, I can see it all in here. For me, this is, this is the power of an LSP, is documentation at a fingertip and navigation. Everything else is nice. Autocomplete's kind of neat, but I don't really feel that. Well, yeah, yeah, and refactoring, of course. So if I wanted to rename this thing, I could rename this, you know, response R. And now notice that it got, re because it had find all references, it could take all those references because they're actual references and then do all of that, right? So that is really cool. For me, that's kind of what I really like. That's my big usage for LSPs. Autocomplete's ni nice. It's nice when you're learning a new language. But it's just that. How do you navigate it back after GD? There's actually some really cool things that I actually have covered in my editor that I've been I've been looking at changing. Uh, Control T navigates back one step from an LSP navigation. 
which is really cool. But I use control, but I, I have it as my uh, my harpoon. So I've been thinking about reconsidering what my harpoon shortcuts are to get that in. Because I, I would like to actually undo LSP navigations. But right now what I do is I use control O. For those that don't know what control O is, it's called a jump list. So you can go help jump list. Uh, and you can go read about what a jump list is. It's control I and control O. And so it's pretty cool. So jump lists are a series of motions cause breakpoints in your editor. And you can hop back up and down your jump list. Also, another nice thing, if you only hop one file, is going to be, uh, there you go, is control, control hat will jump back to the previous file you were just on. So it's called alternate file. It's actually how I developed Harpoon was based off of alternate file. Pretty fun stuff. Anyways, let's see. Then we have a Helix, bottom right, editor. Slightly glaring default color scheme. <laughs> it is very purple. I agree with that. Uh, everything is just there. Helix doesn't have a plug. Let's see. Helix doesn't have plugin support yet, but it has so much more stuff in the in the core that looking through the NeoVim plugins, pretty much all of them are in the core editor. Ironically, one of the features that I feel Helix is missing, folding, is a core part of NeoVim, albeit one of the one that requires some configuration to get good use out of. Helix does have a config file where you can change a huge amount of settings, but is extremely usable IDE out of the box. Thanks to having all of its features enabled by default, but this all, there's a whole series of problems when this when you do this. You take on support for a bunch of stuff as an editor. Things are really easy to get out of date. So, as good as these things are, they can also be a curse as time goes on. So I, I am I am not convinced that this is always a good way to create an editor. The reason why VS Code can do this is because VS Code spends, what, $10 million a year in development from Microsoft, whereas NeoVim and Helix are off the shoulders of anybody who wishes to... Uh, it's way more than that, is it? I thought they had about 30 people working on it. So I figured, okay, the fully loaded cost is 330000 per person. But if it's more than that, I thought it was 30 people. I could be wrong. Okay, well, let's go, let's go more than that. Whatever it is, 30 Microsoft employees... I know they spend a lot of, they spend a lot of money. Oh, I don't know what the fully loaded cost of a Microsoft employee is. Is it on average 333,000? Is it on average 500,000? For those that don't know what fully loaded means, fully loaded is uh, health benefits, uh, account, like just HR that's involved, like uh, incidental cost of having all of this, the VPs, the people talking about it above, like all the cost of an employee all the way through. Right? And so they call it the fully loaded cost. It's everything. And so it's probably a lot more. What's their profit from a VS Code? Your data. That's the point of VS Code. The VS Code is to be able to build an editor in which they can put in all of their stuff they want and to be able to effectively create a walled garden and eventually a, a payment scheme for you to be able to use their editor. That's what it's always done. It's never been about open source. Yeah. It, I just That's what I just said. <laughs> it's It's about... I mean, that's that's what it is. It's about them to be able to use your data and eventually, because I, I assume in 2014 or whenever it came out, they didn't have an understanding of what LLMs. Well, TJ, they didn't have an L understanding about LLMs, but they know they needed you to use their editor because they knew that at some point they were going to figure out how to monetize it. And so I think in the beginning, it was uh, potentially about something different, about potentially dev containers, uh, Azure, other stuff. Everything, yeah, everything besides Copilot is old. Yeah, they knew that if they could lock you in, they were going to be able to do something with it. And let's see. When the user does do something wrong, it is vital to let them know exactly what, where, and how to, uh, and how it went wrong, and if at all possible, what action the user can do to fix it. Operation failed error or syntax error on their own are horrible messages. They often tell you that something somewhere failed, giving almost no information the user can use to troubleshoot. In the worst case. I can even point you to a completely different direction than what is actually needed to fix things. We've all seen that, you know, like especially older, older errors. Uh, you have like a misplaced, just something simple, and it's just like leading you to the craziest things. Git is a good example of this. As much as I love Git, sometimes its error messages are the opposite of helpful. To borrow an example from uh, Julia Evans, if you run Git checkout some non-existent br branch, you get the you get error passback non-existent branch did not match any files known to get. Yeah, that's fine. I think that's why they uh, they uh, all modern 
all modern all modern git uses switch and doesn't use checkout i still use checkout because i'm old and i have fossils but i know that all modern ones tell you to use switch and not checkout it's because checkout is a mess of, of commands checkout is a mess of commands it is true it is true and this i for me i don't even like this is something i don't even notice like i've probably seen this error a hundred times i would i would actually just never even notice this it doesn't even like phase me when i see this i'm like ah branch does not exist uh, another example i covered before the uh, is the contrast between bash and new shell consider the following uh oh my gosh oh my gosh we got tr all right we got some tr right here so we got lsa remove white space cut fields five delimiters this no oh my gosh i don't even know what's happening there this gets all the sizes of the files in kilobyte kilobytes is that or is that kibibytes that's kibibytes but what if we have a typo in the cut field Syntax error, syntax error. I mean, yeah, but Bash is atrocious. Nobody, nobody uses Bash thinking Bash is good, okay? Even bad cop, I am positive of it, would not be like Bash, unironically, is a good language. I think bad cop loves the challenge of the language and has become an expert in the language. She's going to send, dude, she has the same rule I do, which is, the moment you need an array, you probably should switch to a different language, which is a very, which is a very, very valid approach to using good Bash. All right, uh, due to the syntax coming back from BC rather than Bash directly, even the let's see, even the line number it gives you is misleading. In order to have the slightest clue what's going on, you have to start to print debugging. The equivalent in New Shell would be this, which gives the following error message. All right, well that's very nice. Oh well, that's a very that's a very beautiful error. Well, thank you, Newshell. I appreciate that. <laughs> Though the first error isn't helpful, the second one tells us right away that item is not what we expected to be, hopefully pointing us to get type mistake. Newshell error messages are miles ahead of other shells, just being useful, helping you find uh, where you made an error rather than just telling you there's an error somewhere. But it also looks like a custom piece of syntax, which means that all that useful bashness and all those bash utilities that run on so many systems are just not available. So as great as that sounds, I mean, the problem is, is that BC has its own language, right? Wherever BC is. Yeah, BC has its own language. And if you don't do a good job with BC, it's a problem, right? Uh, concise and discoverable documentation. In my NeoVim config, I use WitchKey, a plugin that displays available bindings as you type. I've been using Vim for almost a decade, including a long time without WitchKey. So it's not like I've never learned the key bindings, but I still find which key useful. Why is that, you ask? Well, because even though I use NeoVim every day, by the way, I don't use all the key bindings every day. And I go months between using, for example, DAP, delete a current paragraph. I DAP daily. Bro, I DAP daily. I love DAPing. DAPing and yapping and vapping. Oh my gosh. Sometimes I dip, sometimes I DAP. Uh, control W X swap the current window for the next. Naturally, when you go months without using certain parts of the program, you tend to forget they exist. Which key resolves that handily by offering quick, non-intrusive reminders for what is available? Let's see. Here's what my which key config looks like. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Okay. It's. I mean, it's kind of cool to have a little reference menu for you to do this. This is very Emacsy, right? Which key is a is a uh, observation that Emacs has this really nice which key experience. Therefore. We can have a which key experience. I think Helix has something similar info. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, it's Doom Emacs. Okay, yeah. Looks like skill issue. <laughs> isn't everything skill issues? Like, in the end, isn't everything a skill issue? Now, which key and its like has been around for a while, but other two UI programs have integrated contextual hints without the need for a plugin. The two that I am aware of are ZellaJ and Helix. Yeah. Helix. Uh, yeah, Helix is, is pretty nice. I've used it. It was nice for learning. But Helix also is a bespoke custom navigation that people are probably not as familiar with. Helix uh, both has autocomplete for its built-in command line and contextual hint that appears when you press the first key in a multi-key combo. This drastically helps both new and experienced users learn and remember keybinds without making the editor less powerful. I wonder if you develop I wonder if you develop uh, a Helix a Helix uh, how do you how would you say this? A Helix lower right eye where every time you start typing motions you start looking down just out of habit. You know how there's these weird like habits you will form and you'll start doing things in a weird way? I wonder if that is a potential option. 
Uh, Zella J has a bottom bar displaying key bindings available in the current mode. This has proven invaluable for me, as I don't use a terminal multiplexer much. Uh, let's see, on GUI systems, I use a window manager for managing multiple terminals, terminals, and as such, I tend to forget the key binds. Though it does take up screen space, and uh, let's see, and a person who uses Zella J every day would most likely disable it. The hint bar is more than worth it for new and occasional users. Fair. That seems nice. I don't use Zella J. Mod line, mod line, I guilty. Yeah, see, I know those things are supposed to be great, but they end up always being, uh, these little reminders often can become habits. It's kind of like looking at a keyboard while typing. If you've typed long enough, you stop actually needing to look at your keyboard. It just becomes such a hard habit to break that you like, you just kind of keep on doing it, doing it, doing it. And it's like really hard not to. Let's see. Common use cases should be easy. Where it is possible, documentation should not even be required for most uh, common uses use cases. Whenever I want to use find, I almost always have to look up the first man page. I also don't use it quite often enough to memorize it. But that's totally unneeded. 90% of my use of find take the form of find name foo. Oh, with FD, that is the exact invocation of FD foo. Yeah, see, I find that, I find that more confusing. So for, for those that don't know, find is... Find this means look in the current directory where the name contains foo. I find that to be kind of weird behavior. I feel like that's that's an unusual set of behavior, not the standard behavior. Dead simple, no man page needed. Of course, 10% of the time I'm doing something else that I have to look at the manual even with FD. But the point is that manuals are for when you want to do something with the tool that is not the most common use case. I'd have to think about this. I'm not sure if I fully agree with, uh, perhaps this example is poor. And I just find that I am, I just find this example maybe a bit more, I mean, I, I just learned find instead. I don't know. Is it wrong to have to learn a, is it wrong to have to spend a little bit of time learning a tool? Are defaults bad or good? Or is a bit of time fine? It's just a skill issue. I mean, everything's a skill issue. Like everything's a skill issue. Oh, manuals are for noobs too. Oh yeah, manuals are for noobs too, but like learning a little bit about find, like not even the hard stuff about find, just that it goes folder, name, type, executable, max depth, you know, like just learn a couple of the commands to be mostly useful with it. And then you never have to look it up again. One person's obvious defaults are confusing to another. So this is actually such a good thing to put up. Like ask TJ about this. When TJ or I use VS Code, I find it to be very jarring and confusing. But you'll often hear, oh, I just use it because it's easy to use. Is it? Is it easy to use? Or are you just simply used to that? Is its default easy? Or are you used to it? For me, I'm not used to it. it I find it to be very difficult to use. I don't find, yeah, I find Apple products not to be intuitive. But again, that's just because that's not the way I think. It's the same thing with Windows versus Linux. Yeah, I think some people, people often forget that when someone says something's easy to use, it likely means this is the way I, you know, this is the way I like to use something. Therefore, it is easy for me to use. When I use VS Code, uh, I look like a regular VS Code user, completely unable to code. Yeah, just give me a back button, Apple. I just want a back button. Easy does not equal best. True. Uh, there are many other examples as well. How many of your grep invocations are in the form of grep arfu? This most of mine are. Rip grep shortens that to this, while still having all the power of grep when I need it. And it's faster as well. It is faster, but it is different. It is not meant to be used in conjunction with other processes. Grep is meant to be very POSIX style, meaning that its input and output is meant to kind of flow in a linear kind of way. And so it's very easy to use grep in concordance with a bunch of tools. So I like to use it with parallel and be able to like send it through and be able to do stuff in more of a parallel way, right? Grep is used differently. This isn't to say that tools should be dumb them or dumb themselves down or hobble themselves to make it easier to use. However, they should keep in mind that most common use cases that their tool is likely to be used in and streamline that use case. Fair. I mean, I guess I I I agree. I agree, but I don't like the examples. Many tools were made uh, for one thing and over time have evolved into another thing entirely. This can happen by conscious design or more commonly from an industry or community picking up a tool and using it for something it was not originally designed for. While hacking tools for uses they were not designed 
4 is always fun and in many use cases the only way to do something. It's perhaps better to make dedicated tool when the design choices made for an old use case start hindering the new use cases. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, I, I have a hard time with this because I don't know how much of this stuff is true because I do know a lot of people. A lot of people just don't learn a tool. They dislike their basic experience and then create another tool. It just is this perpetual problem of just like don't you learn the thing and just make your own version of the thing. I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying endlessly reinventing the wheel. Reinventing the wheel but for no purpose. Now, I, I, I am fully under the uh, – fully under the notion that you should reinvent tools to understand them. That is why, like, right now, I am in the process of creating my own auto-scaling. And why would I do my own auto-scaling on Fly.io? I'm hand-rolling it based on usage of machines and everything. Well, the reason why I want to do this is that I actually want to go through the process of learning these things and understanding the effectiveness of what's happening underneath the hood. And then probably I'll switch off to something different, open tofu or whatever. But right now... I want to go through and build something myself for the sake of me building it, for no, for no other reason than me to do that. A great example of this is Just, a command runner heavily inspired by GNU Make. Make was, and in large parts, uh, parts still is, a C build system. Uh, no, com- uh, Make is just a command executor, right? I see people use Make all the time. There's actually, in fact, there's, I don't know where it is, but there's this amazing Make file, like the best Make file for Golang projects. And it's just so good. Uh, maybe it's this one. The time say, let's see, quick tip. Uh, is this is this the one? This one I, This one looks like it's the one. Yeah, this might be it. Where it uses, it uses all this stuff to, uh, to kind of just set up and run your Go project really, really reliably. And it's very, very nice. Uh, is this, yeah, it's Alex's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very, very good one, by the way. I highly recommend this. It is just absolutely phenomenal. And so I will say that Make is not a C build system. It's just a, it's a command runner. And that's that. I use, uh, to, uh, let's say I used to use Make files all the time. Yeah, I actually want to get, I actually want to start re evaluating and reusing a uh, command file or make files more often because they actually are just super useful. Uh, as such, it includes features such as implicit rules. If a file called foo o is needed and there is no explicit rule uh, is there, the C compiler will be invoked on file foo c. There is a similar rules for C++ and linking. Okay, so, uh, I mean, I uh, probably to my misunderstanding, make probably has some C stuff. Okay, so you could say that make was first... First in part four, that, okay, fair, fair and factual. And the mo- file modification, time laziness, uh, fantastic for build system, needs liberal sprinkling of phony rules when used as a task runner. Yeah. Uh, the, these features are good features when, um, when make is being used as a build system. But another major use of make that has emerged has been a way to run common tasks. So alongside make build to build a program, you'd have make bootstrap and make test and make config, etc. This is where the design decisions behind make the build system starts to hinder make the task runner. Making one learn about make the build system in order to work around those features to use make the task runner. However, they make can't stop or can't drop these features, both because projects still actively use Make as a build system, and because even Make files are just used as task runners still work around the foot guns and would be broken by making large changes to its syntax and semantics. Its syntax is a bit goofy. That's fair. What is a good system? What is a good replacement for Make then? Does anybody have a good, nice system for Make? Because I find that anytime I look at any other build system, it provides the same <laughs> grunt, <laughs> Zig. Zig is Zig is shockingly a nice build system. Groovy. TJ, I hate you. Basil. Like everything you're saying though, task from Google. Okay, I haven't I haven't looked at task. But everything I look at is just a like for you to actually use it in any sort of reasonable way requires an ins- just an excessive amount of reading the docs. And it's like, you're not any better. Xmake uh, X, uh, X make is Lua-based. Oh, that's cool. Task file. I'll try some other stuff. Groovy, unironically, not groovy. Yeah. Unironically, not groovy. I actually like CMake. You are the strangest person I've ever met, Vincer. I'm just letting you know. 
That's crazy. Good. Okay, fair. Ninja, I used Ninja for a little bit. Single uh, 100,000 line file, no need and uh, no needed. Yeah. Ansible, uh, is Ansible comparable? You can gradle these nuts, okay? Gradle, gradle is not fun. So it's, to me, it's just like all these systems are just, they're not good, and I'm not even convinced that making it differently would make it better. And so for me, I just, I just have always pretty much used make. And I need, I, it's one of those things that I should probably just deep dive in for like three hours and I'd never need to look at, never need to look up something ever again and just use it. Uh, I've heard stuff good about pre-make. It just uses Lua syntax. I mean, if it uses Lua, I'm happy about it, right? It just works. Yeah, pre-make with CMake, uh, good too. Yes, well, that's, it's just so many tools just to use something. However, Just was designed from the outset to be a command runner, and as a result, it is much easier to pick up the, the Just language and make a quick set of commands that, that can be ran. By leaving behind the old tool, a new tool can be made that better fits the tasks for people to use the tool for. That's true, but it also is availability, right? Like, I already know I have, I, I just assume I have make on my system. If I just execute make, make, it's just, it's pretty much always there. So I just enjoy that. The Dune build system is stellar. But that's a very OCamly thing. Maybe just is something I'll have to check out. I swear if it's NPM just, if 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 it if it is NPM install globally just, I'm gonna throw punch it. Where's the installation? Uh oh nice. It has apt install. Okay, cool. Apt install. Hey, apt install. Nice. It's written in Rust, apparently. Hey. I hear that's a seal. That's a, that's that's how you approve it. Okay. Okay, that's nice. Uh NPM. No JS installation. You can just npm install. Let's go. Let's go. But it's also available all over the place. Okay, that's pretty cool. Maybe I could like it. Maybe hey, maybe I could like it. Uh, another thing I've noticed is that while the language of choice for CLI tools used to be C, most recent tooling has been dominated by Rust and Go. Yeah, Go is a great language, and I Rust has a really nice CLI interface. The uh, Saturday plus Clap is really really nice. Just is actually pretty good. Availability is the only downside. Yeah, I get that. Like, Rust has probably the best command line interface. Clap. Clap is really, really good. Uh, of course, there are exceptions to the pattern. Text was written in Pascal. NeoVim kept C as its primary language. And there's an occasional new tool written in C or C++. But there is still a clear pattern in the language choice for newly written tools. Now, why do you think the pattern has changed? And has these new languages led to an increase in number of tools being written? I think so. And I don't actually think it's the language itself so much as the library surrounding them. Hmm. Bash Bunny just cried, no, no. When I say CLI, what I mean by that is your command line arguments. Have you written anything in C? Yeah, I wrote uh, Twitch chatbot in C. I also wrote uh, network. Uh, I wrote my own network protocol for ro robots for the government in C and a flash driver in C and a planetary pancake motor in C. Planetary pancake driver. Motor driver and see. Uh, both Rust and Go have healthy package ecosystems surrounding interaction with the terminal. Rust has clap for argument parsing. Yep, cross term for dealing with ANSI escape codes and other terminal interactions. I, you know, I learned ANSI just recently, or at least a little bit of ANSI. It's super simple. You really just don't even need a library for most things you're doing. It's actually that easy. If you're building something pretty simple, it's so easy just to build. Like I could right now build my own little printer that prints out something and runs something over and over again without having to worry about it and throwing in some colors. It's actually surprising how easy these things are. Ratatouille for making two e t uh, TUIs. By the way, that is by, um, oh gosh, what is his name? Why am I, for I can see his, I can even see his icon and everything. What's the, what's the guy's name? <sighs> Bit something. Bit what? Who makes Ratatouille? Doesn't uh, Togglebit do a lot of uh, working on Ratatouille? Go has a similar, yeah, yeah. I, I It'd be fun to play around with that just because, uh, no, he wrote Anathema. I thought he ri writes Ratatouille. Uh, Go has a similar set of tools uh, with Cobra. <laughs> I like to call it Cobra. Cobra for the CLI argument parsing, not as good as, not as good as Clap. Viper for config file management integrated with Cobra. Uh, Go, Go, Go Sui, TView, and terminal uh, uh, term UI for TUIs, or Bubble T for pretty, uh, pretty UI components. Bubble T is great. Uh, Charm's pretty great. These libraries combined with extra ergonomics offered by the language themselves make the barrier to entry lower, allowing for more people to experiment and design with ergonomic CLI tools. I don't know if I buy that as an argument. I don't really buy the argument here. I think the... I honestly don't know what is... 
My only argument is that we moved into a heavy UI world and UIs are very clunky and hard to upgrade. And I personally think a CLI is easier to upgrade and keep it into a specific way in which people use. And so therefore the barrier to entry to making a simple tool is much, much lower than making a UI, making something, a UI can't be scripted. Have you heard of Lua? Have you, have, have you been, you know, the thing you're using right now is scripted. It's called Jobber script, right? CLI is way easier and faster. I think CLIs have become really popular due to the fact that they are just so easy to use, right? Jobber script is in fact a scripting UI. Uh, conclusion. Uh, if I have seen further than others, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. Isaac Newton, 19, or 1675. By the way, that's a crazy statement from one, one of the people that are so smart. I mean, that's crazy for him thinking he's standing on the shoulder. Like, we're, are, aren't we all just standing on the shoulder of giants? Once again, I'd like to state that I am not advocating for shiny new tools because they are shiny and new. Likewise, I don't think the old tools are bad, nor does their age alone count against them. However, new tools have the opportunity to learn from their predecessors and build upon them. In this way, the new tools are let's see, unburdened by what has been. Uh, new tools are a tribute to those tools that came before and a recognition of their strengths and an acknowledgement of their weaknesses. I mean, I do generally agree that if you can, anytime you can start over and create something new, you are in fact having all the benefit of the last X amount of years of change. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I, I'm sure there's somebody in here that that insulted Newton. And, well, actually, well, actually, it's just like, shut up. Shut up. People that make fun of Newton and doing that, Dude, you're so st – the hubris you one must contain in their body to do that is just out of control. Now, these new tools not uh, are not the be-all, end-all of the command line interface uh, just because this new generation of tools improve on the older ones. It does not mean they are themselves perfect. As we use these tools, we will become familiar with them, and we will discover their sharp edges, or their common use cases will change, or we develop a new use cases entirely. And when these things happen, we will develop yet another generation of tools, one further polished and adapted for, to our use cases. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, a lot has changed since the uh, creation of Grep. Togglebit, uh, oh, that's funny. Togglebit thought he was getting uh, follow-botted. Also, you never say hi, uh, hi back to him when he says hi. Oh, well, tell him hi. Often I have to raid and bounce. So I like Togglebit, though. I raid him because he is a reliably great raid, and he's very, very smart, and he has a great he has a great experience, and I like what he does. So that's why, I've, that's why I raid Togglebit. I, mean, I guess this just makes, I mean, fundamentally, this does make sense. It's, it's fine to move on from these things. I still use Grep because Grep is just so easily available. It's just always available. And availability does play a large case. I don't use RG that often because I have to. I have to learn the synt. The I have to just go learn the commands for RG. And often when I'm grepping something, I'm grepping something over a small code base. And when I'm rip grepping, I'm using rip grep in a fundamentally different way. I'm using rip grep in through an editor. I use rip grep incidentally, and so I don't have to know about the commands with rip grep. And so it's fine. Do you use awk? I've never. You know, I've never gotten good at awk. I know how to print out a column. So when I have a when I have some sort of separated item and I want the fifth one, I can use awk to grab out the fifth one. Grep is handy. Anything just out, let's see, out of the box is useful when you need to work on a server. Yes, it is. Uh, and you and you can't install things. Yes, grep is a very great tool just to know. That's why I've just never really gotten into RG because I just use RG via the via some sort of uh, editor, right? You didn't have to be so spe specific about not getting good at awk. Okay, get out of here, TJ. Yeah, octua, octua, awk is god tier. Awk is crazy. Awk is absolutely crazy. That's awkward prime. Get out of here. Hey, the name. Is the prime engine.